years ago, uh, I already sensed a increasing division between um, uh, left and right, and Congress was at a gridlock. And I realized uh, that I didn't understand um, what was going on on the other side. I realized that I was in also uh, here in Berkeley, California, in a political bubble that uh, I live in a blue state and in a super blue uh, a town, and I teach sociology to super blue uh, students, and that I wasn't understanding those with whom I uh, disagreed. And I realized that actually uh, all Americans are tend to live in enclaves. There was a new book out uh, called The Big Sort, which indicated that when people move, it's less and less to good jobs and nicer weather, and more and more to culturally congenial um, enclaves. So, uh, and it wasn't just a geographic enclave, but a media enclave, the electronic enclave. And if I put on my computer, I got surrounded with myself. So I decided that I needed to get out of my enclave and go find another enclave that's as far right as Berkeley, California is left, and to take my own um, moral and political alarm system off, really permit myself a lot of curiosity to really get to know um, people um, who have different experiences and different beliefs. So. Uh, looking at the growth of the right, I thought, okay, where should I go? I should go to the South because that's where uh, the right has grown uh, the strongest and fastest. But where in the South? Well, I looked at um, findings in 2012, the, people, the whites who voted for Barack Obama. It was half of whites in California in the whole region of the South, it was a third of whites voted in 2012 for Barack Obama. But in Louisiana, it was 14% of whites voted in 2012 for Obama. So I thought that's perfect. That's, that's where I'd like to go. And I'd like to talk to whites um, and uh, older people, people who, who um, saw a lot of meaning in the Tea Party and see if I could, could get to know them. So as luck would have it, I had one contact who was the mother-in-law of a former student of mine and her best friend, an LSU uh, sorority sister, was uh, a Tea Party uh, aficionado and uh, later voted for Trump. So they were political opposites, but they had keys to each other's houses, they went to plays together, they loved each other's children. So I thought, wow, that's a paradigm of the very thing, the whole country <laughs> needs to be able to do that. Let me get closer to it. So five years later and 60 interviews later and a lot of gumbo cook-offs later and fantastic fishing trips later, <laughs> and looking at people's former schoolhouses and hospitals where they were born and graveyards where their parents were buried. And an extraordinary exposure to wonderful people who, many of whom I now call friends. Um, all that time later, uh, I, I came back with a kind of an answer to the question I set off with. And the question I set off with was, the red state paradox. A lot of um, people are, are scratching their heads. How could it be that in the country as a whole, it's the uh, poorer states, the states with the worst education, the worst medical help, uh, the most um, uh, low, lower, uh, the, the most uh, uh, pollution and the lowest life expectancy are also the states that receive more federal dollars in aid than they give in tax uh, dollars are also the states that are suspicious of the federal government, distrust it, don't look to it for help. So how could that's, that's a paradox. And Louisiana looked like a super red state paradox. It was the second poorest state in the nation, 
44% of the state budget came from the federal government. And it was very strongly uh, Tea Party and ultimately Trump. So uh, from my point of view, I was, I was diving into the very thing I, I didn't understand the most. And within that super red state paradox, I was looking at the environment because in Lake Charles, where I started out my journey, um, I realized that the, the sky wasn't always clean. You know, when there were, nobody was, was swimming in Lake Charles and everybody was drinking bottled waters. And if I, if I got in the car and went over the I-10 bridge to West Lake, my eyes began to sting. I thought, wait a minute, the environment is kind of talking to me here. I, I, I can't ignore it. I, what's going on here too? And I realized that uh, I was in Calcasieu Parish, which is among the 2% most polluted um, counties in, in the nation. And that um, politically, again, there was resistance to the idea of you know, big government regulation and even regulation of polluting industries. They thought it was already okay. Government had already done it. Uh, and yet it, it was suffering uh, this degree of pollution. So that became my keyhole issue. And uh, people were wonderful. They accepted me. I said exactly who I was and what I was doing. And, and they said, well, we're worried about this divide too. And a lot of, you know, you liberals don't understand us. I don't really know us. We're the flyover state. And uh, you have misconceptions uh, of us. Well, please s set your readers straight, which ultimately five years later, I have tried to do. Yes, they turned out to be a lot of people that voted for Trump sort of backed into that vote because they, they felt that nothing else spoke to their issues. It wasn't that they thought he was the most moral person they ever met uh, and, uh, you know, reaching for women's crotches and um, while his wife is pregnant with their child. I mean, uh, his insulting uh, McCain uh, for his uh, military service, uh, uh, imitating a disabled uh, reporter, uh, reviling in a uh, newspaper that uh, expressed disagreement with him or criticism of him, all of this, uh, people shook their heads. And recently I saw a person uh, that I, I wrote about extensively in the book. I have recently visited uh, back in Louisiana and, uh, and I was with my son who asked, uh, well, do you have any reservations uh, about Donald Trump. And <laughs> um, this person, his name is Mike, said, oh, where do I begin? So it's not that they loved him, but that they didn't see anything else that really came close to a promising uh, good jobs and respect for mainstream Americans who do the work of making the world turn. They felt uh, ignored. They felt bypassed. Uh, and that a certain agenda was being imposed on them uh, by liberals that um, ignored the big things from their point of view. So I came to understand this as uh, when I asked people, well, how come you don't want uh, the EPA? You voted for a guy who wants to abolish the Environmental Protection Agency and and you guys could really use some protection. I, I, and these were people who loved nature, knew the call of many birds, loved to go out fishing, uh, knew all the good fishing spots with their work. They hadn't been able to get time to go out fishing. Uh, but then when they did, they worried when the fish was gulping down methane gas. I mean, really, it, it, it was that bad, uh, especially in Bayou corn sinkhole, which was a disaster that uh, I uh, interviewed the victims of, many of whom were Tea Party and Trump. And so how could you go through that degree of ordeal, but not want to vote for a guy who said, that's an ordeal, I don't want anyone else to have to go through. Uh, and so that question still 
still haunts me <laughs> actually to this day. But the best I could come up with as an answer is that the people I came to know had three objections to uh, the federal government. One, it seemed to be, you know, the North, again, wagging its moral fingers um, at the South, saying you bad people in the South, and they didn't like that. But I wouldn't think that's the main thing even. Yes, that's right. That's exactly. So he doesn't, you know, <laughs> get you off of that problem. He has no answer to it. And the second thing was with the uh, Louisiana uh, Department of Environmental Quality, they did not feel it was doing its state job. They were paying their tax money to it, but it was handing out permits uh, like candy, as this person, Mike, um, told me. And uh, so what kind of a government, you know, you, they needed protection, but the government wasn't doing it. And in a way, they came to see the, Louisiana as an oil state and that the state was doing the moral dirty work of the oil companies. That is, the state was pretending to protect people, but not in fact protecting them uh, because state officials were also saying to the companies, oh, come here, we're an easy permitting uh, state. So people felt uh, between a rock and a hard place in that. And they thought that the federal government was only a bigger, badder version of a bad state government. But even under that, was a deeper reason, I think, that they saw the government as, uh, as, as not doing for them. And it came out in what I, I came to call a deep story. What's a deep story? A deep story is a story that you take the facts out of it and you take the moral judgments out of it. It's just a story that feels true to you. And left or right, we all have deep stories, and they're at the bottom of our pol political beliefs, I think. And so this deep story is you're waiting in line, as in a pilgrimage, up a hill, at the top of which is the American dream. And your feet are tired. You've waited a long time. You feel a tremendous sense of deserving. You have gone by the rules you are, and you have worked hard. And you haven't had uh, a raise in two decades, and you're waiting in line for that American dream. And then you see line cutters, and you think, well, wait a minute, like, that's, that's, not, that's not how this is done, that's breaking the rules. <clears throat> and who are the line cutters? Well, line cutters in this right-wing deep story are uh, blacks uh, who, through affirmative action programs, now have access to jobs that had been reserved for whites. And even worse, women like myself, <laughs> who through affirmative action now have access to jobs that used to be reserved for men, and then immigrants, and then refugees, and even the oil-soaked brown pelican, you know, looks like it, it's standing in front of you, has cut in. Many people told me, oh, the environmentalists value animals more than people, and they're ahead of us. They seem to be cutting in. That's the perception. That's how it feels. Mm -hmm. And then Barack Obama, in another moment in this deep story, seems to be waving at the line cutters. And people say, oh, well, maybe he's a line cutter, too. And maybe he's not my president. He's their president. So what we have here, you know, and then someone in this deep story turns around from ahead of you in line, says, oh, you redneck. And then that mm -hmm. snaps. That's a dishonor. That's one thing too many. Then you feel like a stranger in your own land and feel ready for an outsider, any outsider, even if he's going to really bring disaster and disappointment upon you. And so that's the poignant <laughs> deep story that I think underlay. And in the end, the federal government seemed like an instrument of the North. It seemed like an instrument of oil and then an instrument of the line cutters. And I think that that layers of feeling was animated the feelings of Tea Party. And then and then uh, in a way made people into the dry kindling and along came Donald Trump, who lit the match. 
Race is a great issue. It's implied in the deep story uh, that blacks are seen as um, as competitors and seem unfairly advantaged. Uh, I think that's that's perception of it. Um, yes, race was uh, infused uh, all kinds of beliefs. I should say that in the book, I have an appendix which puts facts back there that the, for example, uh, fertility rate of black women is pretty close to that of white women, um, and that most people on welfare work, uh, but they work at low-wage jobs and, and so on. Um, government workers, for example, are federal government workers, 1.9% of all work employed people in America. There are many kind of uh, facts that seem to have come in support of that deep story, um, but that when you check them out, uh, didn't bear, didn't work. Mm -hmm. So, but I, in the end, I, I felt that while I had started with a red state paradox, I ended with a blue state paradox. Why would the Democratic Party, the party of the working man, the working woman, why is it losing working men and women? And I think that's uh, the question that um, a lot of people need to ask now. Well, I think, um, we're at a particular moment in American history where there's a struggle, struggle on, I think, for the soul of the country, really. And I think um, people like yourself, who, who, who are, did not vote for Donald Trump, um, and who are perhaps uh, uh, concerned about the well, basic democratic values, the value of the system, American system of checks and balances and the independent judiciary. You can't just uh, say, look, you're a so-called judge uh, because you uh, don't agree with me. Uh, or that if the press is critical, well, I won't uh, talk to you. Um, that there are principles of an independent press and uh, independent judiciary. Um, and that that's the American way of life, way of democratic life. And if you're concerned that those values are now imperiled, I think it's a very good thing to try and reach out to Trump uh, supporters in goodwill and respectfully. There are a number of programs that help us do this. Uh, one is called Living Room Conversations. I've teamed up with a person here in uh, in uh, Berkeley. Her name is Joan Blades. She's the co-founder of MoveOn.org. She's a mediation lawyer. And we're um, about to um, host a Tea Party a Trump voter uh, here at our house. And she has a son, that is my Tea Party friend, has, uh, she's a single mom. She has a son who, who very much like Bernie Sanders. So she's being a wonderful mother, kind of, uh, bringing her son to Berkeley and uh, we're going to do a living room conversation but they're going on around the country there's another program that's called hi from the other side and you can dial in and really have conversations uh, with people that I think but it's better to get close and break bread together I would love to see ultimately every senior in a high school uh, have a two-week uh, period of visiting a family in another region of the country so that you have coastal kids that go inland, inland kids that are hosted by coastal families, southern kids that are hosted by northern families, northern families uh, hosted with, uh, by southern families, because even if our leaders are pulling us apart and everything you see um, on, on television, on the internet is uh, is uh, hostile and rude and dehumanizing. We can have a people-to-people -people movement uh, and find surprising common ground. And I think it's, uh, it's something we all should do. I think it's urgent.